there's uh, just a few places in the world where the very name needs birds and birding. Cape May in New Jersey is one of them. Ma is an extremely characterful little American seaside town on the Atlantic coast about uh, three hours drive south of New York City and in the summer people flock here to take the sea air and the sun but by mid-September most of the people were actually here to see the birds Autumn is, of course, migration time, and everybody knows the birds fly south for the winter. In uh, Europe, for example, they might be going from Britain down into Africa. Well, same thing's happening on this side of the Atlantic. In Britain, we call them waders. Americans call them shorebirds, which is pretty appropriate in the case of these little chaps, the aptly named Sanderling. In fact, you'll see them chasing the tide line just about on any beach anywhere in the world. I've seen Sanderling in Australia, Southeast Asia, in Indian Ocean, coast of Africa, South America, Britain, of course, and here in North America. It really is the the quintessential shorebird. I love the way they, they don't want to get their feet wet, do they? Sort of down there, oh no, 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 waves coming in, quick, quick, run, 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 run. That little clockwork toys. And uh, another ubiquitous bird, that's the posh word for it, isn't it? All over the world, you'll see turnstones on the beaches too, at least where there's a few stones to turn and a few bits of old seaweed and you find sandhoppers and stuff like that. So sandaling, turnstone, yes, shorebirds, fair enough, they are shorebirds, but this word isn't quite so appropriate for the majority of waders because um, they don't really like the windswept beaches. They prefer little uh, shallow freshwater ponds, little muddy corners and stuff like that. But if I want to see some really big flocks of migratory waders, I'm going to do a little bit of migrating myself in the car, short drive up the coast. the uh, impressive and yet somewhat frustrating aspect of um, American bird refuges as they call them is they are so flipping big. I'm uh, only about an hour's drive out of Cape May, just come a little bit north up the peninsula and this is Brigantine Wildlife Refuge. Nice little muddy corner, absolutely carpeted with birds. See? Right place, right time. Secret of good birding. Okay, what have we got here then? Well, uh, I could tell you the names. There's um, semi palmated sandpipers, there's some western sandpipers, there's uh, a few white rump sandpipers, and there's a few least sandpipers. And they all look terribly, terribly similar. And in fact, um, American bird watchers get over this sort of identification problem by lumping them all together and calling them beeps. Beeps. Isn't that nice? Probably because if they make any noise at all, they tend to go, you guessed it, beep. Well, we wouldn't let it go like that in Britain, would we? 
frankly, I'm inclined to do that right now. Just enjoy the activity, the hustle and bustle that's going on here. These birds frantically feeding away as well they might because they're in the middle of a really incredible journey. Most of these birds would have bred up on the Arctic tundra and it's quite possible that only you know, a few days ago they set off from up there. They travel at night because um, it's cooler then and they lose less energy and during the day they have to literally refuel and that's what these guys are doing. Eat, 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 get the fat reserves up and then eventually they'll get themselves up. So what you are witnessing again is migration actually in action. Or let's say a little pause before it really gets into action. Whoops, here they go. Peregrine. You realise there must be something going on because suddenly all the birds whipped up, great panic going on. And there's a peregrine zooming around just trying to pick out one bird to have a go at. Everything's going up. The gold, the waders are going up, the peeps are going up, the ducks are going up. And that's because the great big peregrine going straight for the middle of them. And of course safety in numbers here because all the birds are wheeling together in a big pack and that confuses the peregrine. doesn't know which one to go for. Here it comes again. Oh! Actually it's a bit unfair on these birds because there's only this one little patch of feeding because the tide's high. So the peregrine comes in, they all swirl around but they can't really go anywhere but come back again. And that's exactly what they're doing. It's amazing how quickly they, the word goes out and say, oh he's gone lads, you know, back to feeding. And down they come and Peck, 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 peck. And everything settles down again. for something completely different, as they say. Um, in Britain, we've got two kinds of sparrows, right? There's house sparrow and tree sparrow. Well, in America, there's dozens of them, but there's one rather cute little job that lives down in the salt marsh, and I'm going to try and lure it out by going like this. amazing how this seems to work on these birds. Psh, 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 psh. It's a sharp-tailed sparrow. It's the other end that's really sharp, little pointy face, and nice little bit of ochre, and a really pretty little sparrow. Psh, 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 psh. They don't do much, and they'll soon get bored with this, but I just thought you'd like to see them. And I would too. Psh, psh, psh. Lovely little scene going on here because the tide's just dropping and the water's not so deep so the really long-legged birds can start wading out there and you've got this lovely little selection of uh, herons and egrets. The great big one, that's a great white egret and then the little one is snow egret which is just like the little egret in Europe and the one that looks a bit like our own heron is called great blue heron here. Be honest, for such elegant birds, they make truly disgusting noises. Just look at the shapes of them. They're contorting in all sorts of positions, marching around in the shallows, and every now and again you can see one sort of thing, ooh, I can see a fish down there, and then wham! Oh, just caught one there. Three glossy ibis is coming in. 
like great big uh, bronzed curlews. Something weird, almost prehistoric about them. Uh, it's the one. Come down, and the other two don't fancy it down here. And the laughing gulls lining up as well. As the tide goes down, they'll expose for bits of food. And the Forster's terns coming out as well and dive bombing. Fantastic. They're, again, as the water gets shallow, I guess the fish are getting even closer to the surface. And these terns are coming out and having a dive as well. Oh, it's lovely. typical American house with uh, a typical American garden. Or is it? Gardening Club Wildlife Garden First Prize. I think so. Pat, I bet you keep a backyard list. We do. Yeah, okay, go on. <laughs> Make me jealous. Then. What is your backyard bird list? Oh, what is it? 193, I think. 193, 193. different species in your garden. In this garden. <laughs> Ooh, a hummingbird. Come on. Wanting to come in, coming to the butterfly bush. Oh, and down to the zinnias Oops. and off it goes, sitting on its favorite perch. Yeah. Now, Pat, this I love because mm. it's got like a little amphitheater, isn't mm. it? You've got the, the stage set up. Birds perform, mm -hmm. you sit up on there in a nice mm -hmm. rocking chair and mm -hmm. enjoy them. Can I do that? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. I'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will. So, by no means a typical garden, but these are typical American garden birds. Blue jays. Like jays the whole world over, they look lovely and they sound horrible. And uh, now that looks like uh, a tit, basically, doesn't it? And um, well, it is. It's actually Carolina chickadee. You see, it's all those words that you've heard of in uh, film titles and stuff like that. My little chickadee. Better than my little tit, anyway. <laughs> What else have we got? Goldfinches. This is American goldfinch, though. Looks, um, to be honest, actually not as pretty as, I think, European goldfinch. Although it has to be said these two aren't at their best. Male looking a bit dowdy after the breeding season. The female really brown. When I say not the same species that we get on the other side. Ah, now this is the one that everybody, when they first come to America, they say, oh, wow, that's fantastic. And yet it turns out to be one of the commonest birds. This is a cardinal, male, absolutely brilliant red, and the female, as ever, not, frankly, quite so striking. And uh, hummingbird. There you go, ruby-throated hummingbird. Doesn't have its ruby throat now because these will be uh, youngsters. And the males with their ruby throats have already gone way off. Imagine that, a little tiny bird like that actually migrates hundreds of miles down into Central and South America. So this little chap is just having a, a fuel up there before it sets off. Gandalf of Channel 6 Action News. A change in the weather, I should say so. This is actually the tail end of a hurricane. Not seeing a lot, just a few windblown seabirds. But here's the good news. This will be followed by a northwest wind and a cold front. Right, out early tomorrow morning, I think.
I'm on my way to one of the great birding experiences of Cape May. In fact, one of the great birding experiences of the whole of America. Dawn at Higby's. Thousands of little birds have been traveling south all night and the northwest following wind brings them at first light to the tip of Cape May. They're all over the place. So am I. I'm too late, I'm too late, I'm missing it and I am. <laughs> if there's one word which sums up this experience, it's panic. I'm surrounded by a warm, zip, 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 all over the flipping place. Can I remember what any of them sound like? No. Connecticut here, straight above. No, where it's dark. Another one coming behind it. Every now and again, uh, a bird will land in the trees. And you try and get binoculars on it, you can't. And then suddenly you do. It'll be chased by a sharpie. A very crown shaped tree. It's in the left hand Male side. Male buckfret of blue. Very expressive grosbeak. Oh, in the uh, top of the trees here. What you've got to do is trust that later in the day you will catch up with them. I remember this, I've got to remind myself. I came here five years ago and I had exactly this experience. I stood there and thought, I hadn't actually seen a single bird. I've seen thousands, but I hadn't really seen one. But during the rest of the morning, I just spent my time wandering around and eventually, at the end of the day, I reckon I'd seen just about every species that earlier on I'd merely seen as a dot. So, faith. Meanwhile, just enjoy the spectacle. This is migration happening here and now. I think this has to be my favourite kind of bird watching. I just love wandering round, taking your time, and you never really know what you're going to see. I suppose in a way that kind of sums up what to me is the ultimate excitement of bird watching, this thing about unpredictability. Somebody used a phrase about jazz music, said it's the sound of surprise, and I think Birding is a hobby of surprise because you just don't know yeah, what you're going to see. The, uh, yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. There's a chance of seeing something like 30 different species of warbler. There could easily be that number on Cape May this day. Keep looking, and it's amazing how many eventually you catch up with. So perverse that such pretty little birds spend so much time hiding. Come out. Psh, 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 psh. Ah, black throated green warbler. Thank you. Ah, oh, now this is a nice, easy one. This is uh, not humbug warbler, no, it's black and white warbler. A cross between a humbug and a tree creeper, really, isn't it? This is a yellow throat. The males in spring have a nice little black mask, but they lose that, but they do still have a nice yellow throat, and the females have yellow throats. Juveniles, though, only just a yellow throat. And I'm afraid that's the problem, because some of these other warblers, although they've got lovely, helpful, descriptive names um, at this time of the year, don't live up to their names at all. I mean, look at this one. This is actually chestnut-sided warbler. Not a sign of chestnut on its side or anywhere else. This is American red start. Well, like English red start, red start means red tail. But this time of the year, females, juveniles, uh-uh, the red's replaced by yellow. It's a very pretty little bird, nevertheless. Another group of warblers who have habitat preferences in their names. Uh, this is totally and utterly useless. This is a prairie warbler. Well, Cape May is not on the prairie. And in fact, I've seen prairie warblers more often in mangrove swamps, as a matter of fact. I don't know why they were called prairie warbler. 
And there's others when, frankly, I have no idea what the name means. Well, actually, I think I have. This is a perula warbler, and I think it's from Latin, meaning um, little tit. So presumably somebody ancient naturalist familiar with British blue tits saw this, and uh, you know, it reminds me of a little tit, which it does, actually. A pretty little bird. And amazingly, by the end of the day searching, I have actually caught up with and had reasonably good views of just about every single bird that was called out confusingly on the dike this morning at Higby's. Take your time and you'll catch up with them. Now this is uh, another of Kate May's magnificent obsessions, hawk watching. Of course if you're uh, looking out for soaring birds of prey it's a jolly good idea to get up somewhere really high, about uh, seven or eight feet. I've grown this place. Last time I was here, only a couple of years ago, it was um, like a little tiny rickety bandstand and now it's absolutely enormous grandstand. And there's people standing on here, dawn till dusk, every single day, right from I think it's about the middle of August right through to December, and they count every single bird of prey that flies over here, doesn't matter how far they are away. One might say, get a life, but to the people who do it, it is alive. They're absolutely obsessed with this. Okay, in this group up here above us, uh, there's an adult broadwing, which is a little unusual here, showing the single white band, broad white band in the tail. Some of the field guides show two bands, but usually in the hawk watching arena, all you can see is one. Turkey vulture that was behind now, it. I've got to admit, this really is pretty esoteric stuff. Um, for a kickoff, just spotting the birds is hard enough because you've got this bright blue, glary sky up there. And then suddenly you'll say, oh, as I have right now, that's a hawk. If you look in that kettle, look down to the bottom. You, know, you sort of move through the ones that you recognize, sharp-shinned hawks, broad-winged hawks, and there at the bottom there is a real long-winged one, and the wings are held slightly uplifted, and it's got, there you just saw a white patch of the rump, that's a northern harrier. There's also the jargon that the hawk watchers use. A kettle, by the way, is um, when a whole bunch of hawks all get together and you suddenly get a swirl of them way up there and it's because there's hot air rising on the thermals and that's actually what you're really looking for because first of all it'll be one, then it'll be two and then suddenly you realise there's maybe 10, 15, 20 birds all together. And then you've got to sort out which kind of hawk they are. Uh, we've got the red-tailed hawk swinging back this way again up with a cooper's hawk. And this one's showing a real long tail, so that is almost certainly a young bird. You think there's nothing until you put your bins up and scan. And I've now got sharp shin hoop and northern harrier. And the harrier, one of the easier ones to tell because they hold their wings up in a V like that. And when they flap, it's real lazy, very gentle. No hurry. Turkey vulture, or TV as we call them for short. Another one that has that wings up in the V shape and they sort of rock from side to side. You wouldn't mistake a turkey vulture, they're big black things. I have to confess, I've got a sort of um, bit of a love-hate relationship with hawk watching. It hurts, your neck hurts, it's hard work, your eyes begin to hurt after a time. Um, you keep seeing the same species, but you can't tear yourself away. But I think I'm going to, because I've, uh, I've sort of had enough actually. No, give it another 10 minutes. <laughs> I 
late afternoon, early evening, and the temperature is dropping down, and so are the birds of prey. It's supper time for the kestrels. And the sky's full of something else too. Dragonflies, there's masses of dragonflies, and that is precisely what these kestrels are feeding on. Every now and again, one swoops down, grabs a dragonfly, sometimes eats it in mid-air, and sometimes brings it onto one of these rather convenient bare branches. It's not the same as the European kestrel. American kestrel, a little bit smaller, and it's got a uh, little bright sort of chestnut bit on there and a uh, little grey surround. There's all sorts of funny little markings on it, but it's a much neater, faster bird than the British kestrel. A bit more like um, our hobby. Really neat little chaps. And there's merlins coming down too. That's um, that's the same species as we get in Europe. Merlin in in Britain, they're always up on the moorlands. They breed up on the moorlands, come down to the coast during the winter. But here, big migration of merlins, which go down into Central uh, America and down into South America to spend the winter. And the odd sharp-shinned hawk. It's actually rather a relief not to be staring up too, because you spend all your day looking up like that. And then finally in the evening, get the neck down and enjoy them on almost high level. This is incredible. Scanning around every reasonable perch has got a little raptor on it. Oh, even as I spoke, that was fantastic timing. Male kestrel just zoomed in onto a snag right in front of me and is nibbling his dragonfly. Nice one. Ah, splendid ending to a splendid day and a splendid week. I really think that more than anywhere else I know Cape May represents that one element that I think makes birding so satisfying, migration. Next week, Bill travels the length and breadth of Israel in search of vultures at the same time, 8 o'clock. From New Jersey to New York, a short hop for Stephen Lacey.